from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. Providing this week's cattle market commentary, Iowa State University's Lee Schultz. Lee will review last Friday's USDA cattle on feed report, and he'll share some observations on how well the cattle industry has emerged from all the market chaos caused by the pandemic. Then K-State's Dale Blassie talking about harvesting grass hay at the proper maturity as a means of reducing winter feeding costs for the cow-calf herd. He'll look at research data which outline how much a producer can save by striking that right balance between forage quality and tonnage. And further ahead, Jeff Wickman with this week's 4-H segment. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Welcome once more to another Agriculture Today, our Monday edition, where we open up as usual. On the cattle markets, we have a new USDA cattle on feed report to discuss, plus a retrospect, if you will, on the cattle industry in 2020. Some interesting information that our guest has uncovered. Lee Schultz is with us once more. Lee is a livestock economist out of Iowa State University. To the Fed market this past week, Lee, cash Fed prices just aren't moving. This market remains flat. It certainly does. It, it's another kind of confirmation. We, we looked at live prices in that 120 range address, maybe 190, 191, a little bit of, of an increase. But, you know, it's, it's really kind of that hem and hog of just staying where we're at, I think. There's still talk of of rather large front end supplies, which are weighing on the market a bit. Last week kind of provided that turnaround, maybe a bit, at least when we look at the futures market. Tuesday was was up large. Um, And to me, it really seems like we're trying to grab onto some positive news. And we got some uh, out of uh, Argentina, in fact, uh, that they're going to halt beef exports, kind of an informal agreement, hopefully to contain prices in that country. And I think there's some implications there, obviously, on our trade front. Uh, they're a rather large market, especially when you talk about the, their exports to China. And China's been, you know, our real star market this year. So I think that helped prices, you know, and we'll see if, if we get further confirmation of that and, and how that helps markets. A little bit of, of certainty with, with grain prices. At least we haven't seen the escalations we've seen the last couple of weeks. I think that's helped prices a little bit. But you know, if we're going to see prices run, it's got to be now because we're really pinning towards key demand period time. Speaking of demand, boxed beef prices relentlessly are climbing the ladder still, Lee. I think we're kind of running out of superlatives, right, to, <laughs> right. to say what what they are. They're, they're lofty. And, and they're, again, they're twofold, right? They're, they're that interaction of, of supply and demand. I, I think you know, part of it is there's a lack of inventory, especially for the, the negotiated market. And so that's why we're seeing this loftiness. Because remember, we're, we're talking about the negotiated box beef prices here. And, and that's only one part of it. I think in other uh, times I've spoke with you, you know, I, I do want to emphasize that that's only one part of the market. But that's a kind of residual part of the market or a real barometer of the market uh, that's going to react to times like this when, when we are seeing tight supplies and very strong demand. There's been a lot talked about uh, labor issues, um, and I think that's really what's driving some of this. It's kind of keeping a lid on what we can slaughter, certainly, because right now there's a lot of incentive to slaughter cattle, right, as, as we're seeing the strength in box beef prices. So I think we can see some some things worked out between plant workers and, and managers and maybe Uh, Maybe that's higher wages, whatever that is to incentivize that labor that could help on this limiting output that we've seen. But it's seemingly going to be a while as this all fleshes out, Lee. It is. And right now, as as I alluded to, right, I mean, if we're going to see some strength here, it's it's Memorial Day, it's it's Father's Day. Right. And and that's 
kind of something we can count on every year before we get into the dog days of summer. We're seeing it certainly on the box beef side of things. That's helping cattle prices. But I think the hope is we, we continue to see some support there um, in those cattle prices. Maybe we get some of those supplies cleaned up and we do see further support in cattle. Well, give us your take on that USDA cattle on feed report and how much stock to put into this report, given it was compared to last spring's disruptions. It's certainly going to take some time uh, to, to slice and dice this. And the easiest I, thing I can say is, you know, we can compare to uh, pre-report expectations because our analysts would, would have the understanding of what happened last year and, and what those, those are this year. You know, I'll tell you, there wasn't too many surprises there. Maybe placements were actually quite a bit higher than, than pre-report expectations. You know, that, that's interesting given the fact that, you know, where feed prices are and the disincentive to place those animals. What I've been reminding folks is we need to, you know, compare to something else. So we can compare to 2019, for example. There it shows that we're pretty close to at par levels with 2019. Um, and that's on feed numbers, placement numbers, as, as well as marketing numbers. And so, you know, I think overall, not too many surprises from this cattle on feed report. Something really that we're going to continue to watch is the placement data. Uh, so placements, yep, they were larger than year ago levels, but we knew what was happening. We had auction markets and such close last year, but, you know, they were still close to at par with, with 2019 levels. What happens going forward? Do feedlots just really try to place heavier animals or do they back away from from some of those placements? And what are the implications for feeder cattle prices then? And most assuredly, those feed costs are going to be instrumental in those trends. And that, you know, what's really important about that is we're talking a lot about five, six, seven dollar corn. Now, realizing those placements are subject to those higher prices. A lot of the cattle that we've marketed recently were fed much cheaper corn. So I think, you know, you're seeing producers maybe feed this higher price corn, but it's only on those last few pounds. That's a much different equation than it is when we're seeing placements at these much higher corn costs. You know, it's been some time since since we've had to run these numbers from an analyst standpoint, you know, you go back to 2012, 2011, 2013 of, of when we've seen these costs and the implications for feedlots. Lee, what we'd like to do in our remaining time is pass along some thoughts that you pulled together recently in an article on 2020 and the cattle industry's resilience during all the uh, things that went awry in 2020. And uh, you say, in fact, that the cattle sector really showed well in as far as its durability amidst this. You might explain. Well, I'll, I'll remind you that, you know, economists are a lot better at predicting the past than the future. So, uh, you know, that, that's why we, a lot of times we can kind of reflect on, on what happened. Also, we're starting to see a lot of data from an annual standpoint being reported by USDA um, these last couple of months. So, th so that was kind of the impetus here to, to kind of look back as well as to, to really provide that confirmation to say, you know, that was a, a tremendously disruptive situation. And by and large, it was very resilient. And, and I think a, a great metric to, to really show there is that Production was actually higher, if you look at commercial beef production in 2020, than it was in 2019. And if you average that production over the 52 weeks that we had, you know, that was about 533 million pounds per week wow. that was produced of beef. That's so, a huge number. It is. I mean, it's, it's really kind of unfathomable, right? And, and also, even if you look at in April and May, what those production numbers was, it was 415 million pounds. So even though we had 30% of slaughter capacity paused at some point, we're still producing millions upon millions of pounds of beef that was still going to a lot of destinations. In a broad context, you also noted that cash receipts to producers did fall, well, nearly 5% last year, the lowest since 2011. What is the significance of that to you? Well, the significance is it, it wasn't production. 
you know, going back to we're providing, you know, large amounts of beef because it's in very strong demand. What we've seen last year is those lower prices and that, that gives lower cash receipts to producers, you know, further context was over 20% lower than the record levels we've seen in, in 2014. And so that directly impacts producer profitability, right? When we're seeing those, those lower receipts. And, you know, we always talk about, you know, here's, here's prices and here's profits. We always got to remember that those profits cycle through the economy, right? And so, you know, when agriculture is doing well, everyone is doing well. Um, and that's the beef sector, that's the pork sector, we can go down the line. And so, you know, this is kind of a, a, a barometer of a metric of how that economy is doing, um, especially in states like Iowa and Kansas, which we really rely on agriculture. And to see receipts lower, you know, that's less of a contribution to our economy. Once more, though, with that considered, you think that uh, it's impressive that the beef cattle sector fared as well as it did last year, and maybe that'll speak to its resilience moving forward. That, that's exactly the flip side of it. So we, we talked about all the major disruptions and the issues, and, and I think in the heat of the moment, you know, I think there was a, a, a much bigger scare just because of the uncertainty, but when we have a chance to go back and reflect you know, that's what's so impressive to me that, you know, there was such a coordinated effort. Um, it it kind of provides that comfort that if, if the industry can get through something like that, that there's challenges that can be mitigated going forward. And, and we certainly have challenges now. Um, so I don't want to downplay those. But just to give you that perspective, I think I think it is uh, really important. And there's also opportunities ahead, too. Well, that's a good upbeat to conclude on, yeah. Lee. Appreciate you offering these thoughts, and in a few weeks, we'll touch base once again. Many thanks. Thank you. He's out of Iowa State University, livestock economist there, Lee Schultz, one of those who regularly contributes to our cattle market segment here on Agriculture Today. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. Agriculture Today continues now. When we look at the cattle markets, it's evident that it's important for producers to economize at every turn. And toward that end, we've invited by once more a beef cattle nutritionist with K-State Research and Extension, Dale Blassie, who has some thoughts on how we tie those costs of production into hay harvest. We're into the growing season, Dale, and you do believe that producers need to contemplate just about anything and everything that has to do with their uh, cost to returns. And this is along this line. That's right, Eric. I mean, our producers uh, during the summer... Their thoughts are on putting up the necessary quantities of hay for their incoming winter feed needs. And in many cases, uh, they're trying to maximize their tonnage just to, to cover with what they have with little thought about the consequences, if you will, from the additional requirements for more protein to meet the needs for our cow herds, especially for our first and second calf cows. We're concentrating on the cow herd here and those feed costs anticipated for the fall and winter. When we look at hay harvesting as the variable of consideration here, Dale, it always does come back to tonnage versus quality, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, you, you think about when we typically harvest our prairie hay as a good case in point, we tend to see it even as late as October. And from a nutrition perspective, there's always a six-month delay in terms of the growing conditions we experience uh, in terms of droughty conditions, uh, reduced uh, tonnage of hay, perhaps stress plants that translate into high nitrate forages. And then we experience the full effect six months later when we're actually utilizing that material for sustaining our cow herds. Talking of native grass, native hay for a moment here, it's fairly well documented how that quality 
tends to slip as we move through the growing season? That's right. You know, I've been around here since they invented rocks, and I can remember <laughs> a day when we did a project down in Butler, Cali, and Marion County. And, you know, if we look at uh, the first part of June, we're looking at prairie hay quality somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 12%. And it's soon after that, about the 1st of July, where that slide really starts to substantially uh, decrease. And so we do see that decline. We know it happens in our environment here. We see a reduction in the amount of precipitation. Of course, it gets hotter and drier. And our quality, it's just the natural life cycle of our our native prairie in terms of the quality decline that we experience. So you can attach, and this has been done through research as well, actual harvest dates for that hay and very definitive numbers on the quality that is resulting at those dates. That's right. You know, we sampled uh, in this one particular study that I referenced, we, we went every two weeks and we just, again... Typically, uh, we talk about harvesting, at least thinking about harvesting prairie hay around July the 4th, Mm -hmm. and that's probably a good consideration for a lot of our producers without giving much up in terms of yield. That's roughly the balance to strike between quality and volume then? That's right. And then, of course, as you go later, and we harvest it as late as the first week in October, and our quality, and I call it DOT hay, Department of Transportation hay, that's uh, (laughs) really nothing better than to hold down the soil from washing along our roads. It is a challenge. It's a skeleton for trying to build a, a good diet for your beef cow when she's late pregnancy or early lactating. It's impossible. And with our protein supplements and our our whole feed and grain complex going up 30 to 40 percent, at least on the protein side, it really makes extra sense for folks to be thinking about it now, six months before we deal with the realities of helping to meet the needs of our cows with unknown environmental conditions that we're going to see. Well, you have tied some supplemental feed cost numbers into that harvest date and the subsequent effect on quality as well as tonnage. There's a difference to be made here, it looks. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we, if we harvest July 1 with a crude protein of 8%, our total supplemental cost for it, and I used an 1,100-pound cow, which perhaps might be uh, non-existent out there today, but uh, early first three, four months of of lactation, a cost of about $13, as opposed to waiting to at least maybe the end of July, then we're looking at $28. So, you know, you you run the multiples on the number of females, and uh, that number, all of a sudden, you're not just dealing with pennies, you're dealing with true dollars. Obviously, if you harvest even later, for whatever reason, late summer, early fall, those costs skyrocket then. Oh, by almost four times, uh, from $12 up to almost $45, it should get somebody's attention. And again, we need the yield. There's no question about it. And one thing that I do tell producers is if if you're doing an average replacement rate of, of 15 females and you're holding back replacement heifers, Mark the amount of of the younger females, especially the first parity. Those animals are still growing, and they tend to fall out of the herd at a higher rate. You spend all the money developing these females. You get them through that first calf, and then they fail to breed at the earlier part of the breeding season. They, They tend to fall out. Mark the amount of animals you have. And go for that earlier harvest to get the better quality feed to to help those young ladies along uh, in terms of making that second winter uh, with that calf. Now you're strategizing and targeting your harvests to the need, uh, which will vary amongst animals in the herd. But you think that that's well worth the effort. Definitely, especially with these higher protein costs. And, you know, not only put up the feed, but strategically place it where you plan on rooming these young ladies so that it's available and identify it. Uh, Keep that stuff identified so that when the time comes, the first part of February or whenever, and you need it, it's there. It's available and you you know the quality. It's going to be a better quality feed. And in the long run, it's going to be better for your your cow herd. And you're going to coast through there and your postpartum intervals are, are not going to suffer And again, who knows what kind of a a cold period we're going to see or 
the precip that we may see next winter, nobody knows. So, you, you know, you hope for the best and plan for the worst, basically. And this targeting could go beyond just replacement heifers, could it not? Sure, of course. I mean, you can run the numbers, and, and if you're going to if you're going to lose 10, 15, 20 percent yield, then you've got to start thinking about if you're going to have enough feed to cover. Your average feed days that you do plan on and take inventory on what you may have left over from this year, too. Use that for the mature cows. Clean up the older stuff earlier on before they really get into the rigors of, of early lactation. You can utilize that material and, and take advantage of it. Dale, in an article that you recently wrote on this topic, you did identify the general parameters for harvesting various forages, including not only native warm season grasses, but cool season grasses, legumes, and the like. And these hold pretty well, don't they? I think they do. I mean, these are really uh, certainly not new recommendations. I mean, We've got a vast amount of good work from extension specialists previous to me and in agronomy and animal sciences, and it it just makes sense that if you're going to go for quality, and when you go for quality, you take care of the feed. You don't put it on the side of the fields underneath trees and let it collect precipitation. It's amazing on these larger round bales, uh, the geometry of these larger round bales, the majority of that hay is is located in the outer 12 inches of those large round bales. And you got to take care of what you got. you got to keep the animal in mind as, as you harvest it and handle it and treat it like gold, actually. Yeah. That storage factor is yet another element here. Native hay, that early to mid-July frame, cool season grass, what, late spring, early summer? Yes, certainly. Uh, you want to get it, you know, as it starts to show the heads, uh, certainly for smooth brome and Again, with tall fescue, we've got to worry about endophyte and everything there. So those folks have, are already well into that cutting. We've got to be cognizant of that, especially on some of the older variety, you know, the older fescues. We've got to be on top of that as well. And I might just add here as well, for those who plant cereal crops for forage now, that's dictated by the stage of growth more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, we talk about any of the cereals up up to the milk stage. I've had a lot of people ask about, you know, if you have onless wheat, you know, you start popping on, uh, worrying about the uh, what they call woody tongue or actinomycosis, I believe. Concerns about that. And certainly with onless, it's, it's not as much a concern as it is with the older style wheats. But uh, again, keeping that quality there, making a good quality feed. Uh, it's really hard to beat a good quality oat hay, actually, if you put it up at the proper stage. It's a wonderful feed product. Not only for the purposes of quality, but for the economics, as Dale is saying, that harvesting hay, whatever hay source it might be, at the proper maturity can, in fact, reduce those feed costs come fall and winter. cow calf producers, it's something you might want to put a little more management into as we're into the haying season right now. Good points all. Dale, thanks for coming over. Thank you, Eric. Dale Blassie with us, beef cattle nutritionist, K-State Research and Extension, endorsing this idea of conducting a forage needs inventory of your entire cow herd and then developing a hay harvesting schedule that accommodates the various needs within the herd. Looking forward, as Dale says, the research bears this out, that supplemental feed costs can be shaved considerably by striking that balance between better quality and adequate tonnage. You're tuned into Agriculture Today, and now we'll step aside for a few moments and be back with more here on the K-State Radio Network. Please keep it right here. When a thunderstorm approaches, follow these safety tips. Lightning, known as the underrated killer, usually strikes the tallest objects. So avoid standing beneath trees or other isolated tall objects. Take shelter in a sturdy building. Remember, if you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Help keep you and your family safe this severe weather season. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And continuing on now with a look at today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, we talked of the USDA's cattle on feed report in our cattle market session with Lee Schultz earlier. Here are the Kansas numbers from Friday's cattle on feed report. Kansas feed lots with capacities of 1,000 or more head holding 2.47 million cattle on feed as of May the 1st. That inventory was up 6% from last year. The placements during April, 435,000 head, up 23% from 2020. But to remind you, of course, uh, comparing in uh, different ways here because of the irregularities of last year. And fed cattle marketings for the month of April, according to the USDA, totaling 435,000 head. That was up 40% from last year. The USDA is rolling out several market-based education tools for cattle and livestock producers over the next few weeks. Here's a look ahead to those from the USDA's Rod Bain. May is National Beef Month, and USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service is using the occasion to roll out a series of market-based educational tools for cattle producers to understand and use AMS livestock mandatory reporting data. AMS Associate Deputy Administrator Taylor Cox says products include a short video, user guide, and coming up. The series of webinars we're going to host in June is targeted towards those producers who maybe not use the data quite as frequently and to really show them in real world scenario how this data can be used. And we're going to do that by having different producer levels attend. So we're going to have a large feeder, a mid-size, a cow-calf producer, and they'll speak specifically how they use this data. Details on the June 8th through 10th webinars are available at www.ams.usda.gov. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Back on Friday, the USDA announced it will start paying off up to $4 billion in debt for minority farmers, with notices going out to producers about their payment relief. USDA officials started the process of debt relief for just under 16,000 borrowers by sending them notices that the USDA will be making payments on Farm Service Agency direct loans, direct loans accounting for about 85 percent of all loans the USDA will be paying off. There are also guaranteed loans with private lenders that will be paid off later this summer, as well as loans that have been previously referred to the Department of Treasury for debt collection, according to the USDA. A notice from the department will be posted in the Federal Register. Actual payments will start in June, according to the department. Under the loan provisions, the USDA will pay off loan debt for socially disadvantaged farmers for those direct loans, guaranteed loans, commodity credit corporation loans, or farm Farm storage facility loans that had a debt balance as of January the 1st of this year. USDA officials noted loans closed after January 1 are not included in this loan payment plan. Now, the USDA reports that socially disadvantaged farmers have $2.67 billion in current active loans as of December the 31st, along with another $414 million in delinquent debt. Congress included the extra 20 percent of the loan repayment to offset tax liability that producers would incur. That puts the debt repayment at around $3.7 billion. And Kansas City Southern has abandoned its agreement to be acquired by Canadian Pacific now, choosing instead that competing bid from Canadian National Railway with a larger price tag, but also with greater regulatory risks. The decision on Friday came one day after Canadian Pacific said that it was not budging from its initial $25 billion buyout agreement made in March, even after Kansas City Southern said that a richer $33 billion bid from Canadian National appeared to be a superior bid. Canadian Pacific had consistently argued that a tie-up between Kansas City Southern and Canadian National would have trouble getting approved by antitrust regulators. As recently as Thursday, it said that it would not boost its original offer. Canadian Pacific had asserted that their combination with Kansas City Southern was most likely to get the green light from regulators. Both Kansas City Southern and Canadian National operate rails that run north and south through the center of the country, which Canadian Pacific believes would create antitrust issues in a merger. And while Kansas City Southern is the smallest of the major railroads operating in the U.S., its routes that run from Chicago to Laredo, Texas, continuing into Mexico, make it extremely desirable for any rival railroad that would seek to own it, as well as a potentially risky bet before regulators. 
Now, U.S. regulators have not approved any major railroad mergers since the 1990s, and officials have said that any deal involving one of the handful of Class I railroads, a group that includes Kansas City Southern, must enhance competition and serve the public interest. A Kansas State University livestock specialist is encouraging the state's swine producers to take time to fill out a survey that you may be receiving in the next few weeks from the USDA. K-State's Joel DeRushi says that the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service is conducting a national study of large and small swine operations in the U.S., and producers from across the country are selected at random and are being asked to participate. Joel saying that producers will be asked asked about health, production management practices, marketing, and other hog farm topics specific to their operation. The information gleaned from these, he says, will help combat misinformation, such as on housing types, on the use of medication, and other topics. All of the information provided by producers, Joel reminds, is fully confidential, used only in the aggregate. NAS reported that approximately 5,000 swine operations from 38 states have been asked to participate in this study on small swine operations, those fewer than 1,000 pigs. Now, for the study on large swine operations, those with more than 1,000 pigs on site, NAS has randomly selected nearly 2,700 operations from 13 of the nation's top swine-producing states. The data from the 2021 survey will be compared to data collected back in 2007 and 2012, says Joel, to provide information on industry trends in animal health, management practices, marketing, and other topics dealing with practical aspects of the hog farm. Kansas producers who were selected to participate may already have been contacted about the survey. Officials with NAS indicate that the survey should reach the state's producers during the week of June the 15th. Anybody wanting more information about the upcoming hog producer surveys can contact their local K-State Research and Extension office. That is a glance to today's agricultural news headlines for you. We'll take one final break, and when we return, K-State's Amy Solick will be joining Jeff Wickman for this week's 4-H segment. That is next. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Thousands of Kansas 4-H members will be putting their projects on display this summer, representing nearly a year's worth of hands-on work, as well as some trial and error learning. In addition to displaying their work, Southwest Area Kansas 4-H Youth Development Specialist Amy Solick says 4-H youth receive valuable feedback from judges. Amy, kind of hard to believe, but before we know it, county fairs will be here, and part of that is getting ready for the 4-H fair, and that includes a lot of exhibits. That's right. I can't believe it's almost summer. Schools are getting out and wrapping the school year up, and and that means that county fair season will be uh, in full swing here in just another month or two. When we talk about the project exhibits, what exactly goes into that, and how do the youth get prepared for it? Yeah, so the 4-H project exhibit is really sort of the opportunity to showcase the best work or what they've learned throughout a year's worth of exploration and learning in a given 4-H project area. And so it can be in a number of different things. It can be an actual item that the young person has baked or sewn or built, such as, you know, a plate of cookies or muffins. But it can also be a poster or some type of educational display that really shows off to the public what they've learned, maybe some activities from a 4-H curriculum guide. But it's, it's an opportunity to tell the world about what they've learned and what skills they've gained. So how do they go about doing that? I, I, it sounds like something that you want to really spotlight, but I'm assuming there is probably a right way and maybe a not-so-right way to do that. <laughs> right. Well, you know, the, the not-so-right way 
is to not practice and be engaged in a, the year-round learning experience, right? So we know that the 4-H year begins in October with young people selecting the projects that they want to learn about the rest of the year. And so really the exhibit that is brought to the fair is essentially reflected of a year's worth of work. So, you know, if a child has been baking throughout the year, then hopefully by the time July rolls around, this isn't their first batch of muffins. You know, we would expect that they've had a lot of trial and error and practice rounds. Of course, nobody complains about having too many muffins around the house or cookies. <laughs> you know, but if it's, if it's a craft, if it's sewing, it's something they've been working on for quite some time. And what they choose to bring to the fair is kind of the sample of their best work. Is there a way to determine what is their best work? Is this something that they might go to their club leader or someone else who's in that project area and ask for some advice? Yeah, a lot of times there will be a 4-H project leader that has been teaching them or, or working with them throughout the year or a parent that happens to have, you know, knowledge in a particular area, maybe a teacher or a 4-H club leader. We have a lot of adult volunteers in place to make sure that our kids are learning appropriately for their age and their skill level and that they get some guidance and coaching throughout the year. We also have, you know, many knowledgeable extension agents across the state that spend a considerable amount of time updating and creating their fair books, which for a 4-H family, you'll know what a fair book is real soon where it outlines what you need to be bringing to the fair in terms of, you know, is it a loaf of bread if you're enrolled in the foods project or, you know, the plate of muffins or cookies or whatever the exhibit might be. It it could be a model rocket. It could be, you know, a cabinet that they built in woodworking. So there is a little bit of criteria that you need to make sure your exhibit follows. But again, it's all pretty easy to understand in, in your local fair book. And all of these are on display and judged. Yes, that's right. That's actually the the part I love the most about any county fair is the consultative judging process. And so kids sit down with an adult who has expertise in a given project area and they have a conversation about what the exhibit is. If it's an arts project or a photography project, for example, they'll sit down and have that conversation with the adults about, you know, here's why I chose to take this photo and and the lighting was such and you know I set my camera to these different settings and then the judge can give some feedback you know what really worked well about it what they might do differently if they could do it over again and kind of encourage them to continue their learning experience you mentioned that a lot of these projects have been ongoing since October When do they really need to decide what they want to bring to the fair? Are we getting close to that point? Yeah, a lot of local units across the state have specific entry deadlines. Um, So you kind of need to know, have a vague idea of what project exhibits you'll be bringing. The actual item can be decided a little bit closer. A lot of fairs have what they call like a flop class because a lot can be learned from things that don't go as planned, right? So we want to give kids those opportunities to even, you know, have a humorous showcase on, you know, the the cookies that did not turn out or the rocket, you know, that didn't blast off. There's a lot to be learned, like I said, from things that don't go perfectly. So, you know, whether it's the best work you've ever done or, or something goes amiss, there's a lot to be learned and a lot to sort of take forward with you in next year's 4-H project work. Is the foods area maybe a little bit more difficult because you have to kind of do that right before the fair, right? You can't be giving them stale muffins. Yeah, there's a lot of late night baking the evenings prior to the start of the county fair. I always joke, it's like, you know, if you kids have extras, I'm more than willing to taste test and and give you my opinion. (laughs) (laughs) But really, the judging experience is the real meat, if you will, of the learning experience where they have that opportunity to sit down and get feedback, explain what they've done throughout the year to get ready for this, and maybe explain what they have in in front of the judge and, and what worked and what didn't work. And everything is judged according to a set of standards. So there's no surprises. Everything is evaluated 
basically you're kind of competing against yourself in what we call the Danish system. So, you know, me as a 10-year-old and my skill set is different than the next 10-year-old and their skill set. And we're really just doing our best work against what our own innate ability is, which is a great introduction to competition for kids because you're really competing against your own abilities at this point. And it really isn't until we select maybe champions or higher awards that we're actually comparing items to other items. So it's a very wholesome, very educational experience and one that kids really learn a lot about. That's Southwest Area Kansas 4-H Youth Development Specialist, Amy Solick. Again, for more information, visit your local extension office. And to learn more about Kansas 4-H, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.